Um, good evening, everybody out there in internet land. Uh, my name is Dr. Ben Bellarada. I'm the laboratory director here at Crow County Archaeological Center. And we're really excited to bring you tonight's presentation. Uh, it's entitled The Pueblo of Acme's Cultural Inheritance and Archaeological Partnership in the Lands in Between of Southeastern Utah with uh, Dr. Sam Dewey, Kurt Riley, and Kenny Lynch. But before we get started, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about our organization and the webinar series and uh, give you a couple tips on how to improve your viewing experience. Um, let's start with Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, or Navajo, and Hickory Apache people whose, um, on whose traditional homelands this institution sits. Our mission-related work would not be possible without indigenous people in the past, present, and future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Procanyon is grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. And um, <clears throat> Uh, you can find out a lot more about us by visiting our website, um, and we have actually also expanded access to online Indigenous resources in our website very recently. Um, so you can find universities, uh, related studies and student unions, you can learn about Indigenous organizations nationwide, get access to Native media, podcasts, artists, authors, and more. And you can get links to travel homepages and official websites. So you can learn more about this by visiting our website and find those links at www.crowcanyon.org slash online indigenous resources. Um, and we want to remind you that your gifts, gifts make this program possible. So thank you very much. Uh, and you can learn more about ways to support our nonprofit mission by visiting our website, which is again, www.crocanyon.org slash support us. Um, and I know over the last three years, uh, in particular, a lot of us around the country and, and larger world have become very uh, accustomed to using the video conferencing program, Zoom. Uh, but in case you haven't, um, or you're just not that familiar with it, I'll give you a couple tips to help enhance your viewing experience. So to start with, you can ask the uh, question and answers, or so you can ask questions in the Q&A. And somewhere on your Zoom screen, you should see this little black box here with these icons that say chat, raise hand, Q&A, and live transcript. And if you click on that Q&A, you can go ahead and type in your questions. And our webinar guru, Taylor Hasbrook, and I will be trying to combine similar questions over the course of the webinar. Um, and then after um, our guests are, are done with their presentation, we'll go ahead and ask some of those questions. Uh, now, we might not get to everything, but we will definitely try to. And if you're having difficulties uh, with your, the, the streaming of this presentation, you can head over to our live stream at crowdcanyon.org slash Facebook. And that's basically a nearly to the second um, um, version of this. And so it's like a one or two second delay. You can ask questions there as well. And we'll try to incorporate those into the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, and then we can also invite you to subscribe to us on uh, the, our YouTube channel, which is crowcanyon.org slash YouTube. And um, by doing that, you can view presentations from past webinars uh, back to the beginning of our series about three years ago. Um, and so, and then you can also watch this presentation again if you want. Uh, and um, so we ask you to like and subscribe uh, to our, our our channel on, on YouTube, and that will help us enhance, or sorry, that will help us unlock other types of functions that will that will enhance your viewing experience even more. Next week and every Thursday, uh, we will be having additional webinars. This is just our second webinar of the year, but every Thursday you'll be able to view additional webinars. So next week we have a really exciting presentation called "Footsteps into the Past at White Sands National Park." Uh, we have Dr. Matthew Bennett on some of the really intriguing evidence of uh, very early um, evidence of, of Native American people in, in the, um, North America. Uh, and that's Thursday, February 16th at 4 p.m. And then the following week, we'll have Dr. Emily Jones talking about horses and humans in the early historic uh, North American West. And that's 
uh, Thursday, uh, February 23rd at 4 p.m. Then I would like to now uh, discuss and introduce our speakers for this evening. Um, so uh, our <clears throat> one of our primary speakers, Dr. Sam Dewey, is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Oklahoma and graduated from the University of Michigan and the University of Arizona, my alma mater as well. Uh, he worked, he has worked uh, for over 20 years in the American Southwest. And we just found out as a fifth grade student, he actually came to Crow Canyon and he he told me that this probably you know influenced his career for from from then on. Um, so how do your kids sign up for our programs? <laughs> so his interests are in uh, writing collaborative histories with Pueblo people using a wide range of archaeological approaches. Uh, our other contributing author is Kurt Riley, who is an enrolled member of the Pueblo of Acoma. He's a graduate of the University of New Mexico and has served as uh, the appointed second lieutenant governor of the Pueblo in 2015 and governor from 2016 through 2018. He's currently retired, remains active in his retirement. He serves on the board of trustees, the National Parks Conservation Association, is, and is, is an advisor, um, sorry, is, is on the advisory board member of the National Parks Conservation Association in the Southwest region. He's a member of the Pueblo of Acoma Historic Preservation Advisory Board as well. And then our final presenter is Kenny Winch. He's a preservation archaeologist working for the Bears Ears Partnership, or BEP, some people call it BEEP, uh, formerly known as the Friends of Cedar Mesa. They just changed their name last year. Uh, he is BEP's coordinator for the Lands in Between campaign, a broad-based conservation partnership that includes both conservation nonprofits like the BEP and indigenous entities like the Pueblo of Acoma. Prior to joining the BEP, Winch was a longtime agency archaeologist with the state of Utah. Um, and he received his master's degree in anthropology from Brigham Young University and focused his graduate research on the public lands that are now being called the lands in between. So um, without further ado, then, I'm going to introduce our presentation that uh, these great folks have for us called the Pueblo of Acoma's cultural inheritance and archeological partnership in the lands in between of Southeastern Utah. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this, the screen over to you now, um, Dr. Dewey. Go ahead and stop my screen share and you can start yours and take it away. Thank you very much for joining us. And Sam, I think you're still muted. There you go. Oh, I am. I am. I use Zoom all the time and I'm never good at it. So, hey, <laughs> thank, thanks, Ben. And um, on behalf of my myself and, uh, and Kurt and Kenny and the rest of our team, just want to extend uh, a great deal of gratitude for Crow Canyon for um, hosting us today and for the crazy amount of people who have showed up to hear us talk. So this is uh, actually wonderful. I think we all have butterflies. Um, talking about our project to so many folks. And so it's, it's really wonderful, um, wonderful being here. Thank you. Um, ben, thanks for the, the great introduction. Um, today, we just want to talk about a incipient, rather, rather new, but pretty exciting uh, heritage partnership, a collaboration that we put together um, studying um, the area of Southeastern Utah and um, in Akama's ancestral homeland and how archaeologists, nonprofits, and academics are, are working together to address some really interesting uh, social, cultural, historical issues. All right. So the, to start, what is the lands between? Now, Kenny will talk about this more when he gives a little more, more context to this project. But the lands between is an area in southeastern Utah, colloquially known as lands between right now, because it's between two lands. <laughs> um, on one side, on the on the west side, there's there's Bears Ears National Monument, and on the east side, there's Canyon of the Ancients National Monument, in the Colorado State Line. And this is an area that is both incredibly archaeologically and historically rich, and also incredibly significant. Um, you, you're all probably familiar with Edgar Hewitt, um, you know, the the writer of the Antiquities Act, and a, famous archaeologist. 
He considered this as one of the really important archaeological areas or districts in the Southwest that is uh, worthy of preservation. The lands between has never been federally protected um, like other areas in the Southwest. And, um, but it is actually incredibly uh, significant. We want to talk to you about that today. It's really, really important for, for two fundamental reasons and they're, they're, they're interrelated. Uh, and this is, you know, um, Kenny will talk about the important archeological and historical significance to the lands between um, and, um, and why this is so crucially important, not only for Native, Southwest Native American and Pueblo history, but also for some really fascinating questions that archeologists worldwide would think about, like the Neolithic transition, et cetera. But then the other aspect and the one that we want, really want to focus on as well, and this will be Kurt Riley's portion, is talking about uh, the fact that for Akama, this is, I'm not gonna speak for Kurt here, but what I've been told and informed is that this is an incredibly important place in Akama's homeland. Uh, and these were the, the parts of the, the early part of the migration to their, their homes today. And, uh, and this is not just archeological sites in the lands between are not just simply reminders or echoes of the past, but they're living places that have their protection is, 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 is integral to the future health and well-being of the Pueblo. Um, and so we're, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that. And so the questions that we kind of have when you start talking about these two, start thinking about these two really important aspects of the lands between is like, how can we protect this landscape? But also how can we ensure that um, native communities, including the Pueblo of Akama, have, um, have access and, and management of these places? And how can we do work, work of some kind that can benefit and the community of Acma and other Pueblo Native communities. And so what this talk is all about is our, our early, early tries at, at trying to create a partnership um, between Pueblo of Acma, academic, academics like me, and nonprofits like uh, Bears Ears Partnership and National Parks Conservation Association to try to figure out a way forward that we can do a heritage project that is beneficial to all parties involved. And so well, I wanna just talk a little bit about the partnership that we've created um, before we sort of get to the context of things. This is an image of our, of our core team that we put together. Um, Kurt, Kurt Riley's not in this because he's a super busy guy and he's been on every Zoom meeting besides this, but couldn't make our first meeting last year in Southeastern Utah. And we felt really sad about it, but then we've, um, we've been able to, to, to hang out with Kurt every, every time since. Um, but this is, uh, you know, from left to right, uh, Kenny Winch, who you'll hear shortly, if you don't know him already, he's a great guy. Myself, Chris Garcia, Kurt Anschutz, um, Everett Garcia, and Carl Pedro. And, um, and we, had a, we had a mix of, of folks who got together during the pandemic and started to form this partnership on, on Zoom of all things. Uh, and we had pre-existing relationships together. Some of us had been up to the lands between before. Um, and we all got together with, under, with trying to understand um, how could we form a partnership to deal with those issues that I just brought up together. We started, we realized that Zoom was not an effective way to grow a partnership beyond a certain point. And we needed to be under the open sky into these places and start to talk about how could we put a, a plan forward? Or how could we start thinking about um, the, the, this, this sort of partnership? And so what we did is last, last fall, last October, we spent 10 days up in the lands between and Kenny took us around in, the, in, his, in, his, in his four wheel drive van and we must've put on hundreds and hundreds of miles because in that area of the world, you put on hundreds of miles to see anything. Um, and uh, and we, we, we saw tons of, you know, what archeologists would consider sites, what Akamai would consider really important places in their history um, and, uh, and visited a, a lot of places that are both, you know, archeologically significant and significant to our Akamai colleagues. And uh, we, um, we spent a lot of time and we, one of the really important aspects though, is that we started to create friendships of trust some of us knew each other a little bit, but most of us didn't. 
And uh, we got to start to get to know each other and visiting and identifying these really significant places. We started to ask ourselves or ask each other, you know, challenging questions. Where do we go from here? And when we started this project, the archaeologists in the crew, Kurt Anschutz, Kenny, and myself, really had some archaeologically what we thought were grand ideas that we were going to work with Akama and nominate na places in National Register and protect these places and, and everything else. And it was, it was sound, ethical. And we had these really great discussions both during the, during the course of the field trip and then afterwards where our Akama colleagues said, hold it, wait a second. Um, we were kind of putting the cart before the horse. And these are good ideas. They might have purchased later, down, later on down the line, but for a true partnership to happen, everybody has to start on the ground floor. Everyone has to be you know, coming up with ideas, brainstorming and driving this bus together. And so what we decided to do was instead of trying to, as archeologists, trying to sell our idea and gain blessing to Akama to go forward, we decided to take the project a different route. And that was to um, actually invite 15 uh, leaders and, 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 and elders from the Pueblo up to the lands between. And this happened this past November, so a few months ago, and to get people on the ground and have their own experiences with these places in order for people to, the Akama community members, to start to understand how they wanted to approach these questions, what work could look like, what action could look like. And so what we did is we had a whole bunch of us were on a big field trip. Um, there was a core team, there was 15 um, uh, members from, from Akama, and then archeology span friends and land managers and our nonprofit friends. And we all got together and had just an absolutely wonderful four days um, in the lands between visiting those places that we thought were very significant from the year prior. And uh, this is us going up to um, what we're calling the migration panel, which some of you may know as the procession panel, walking in the, the footsteps of, of, of Akama's ancestors. And uh, we actually, I love this, I love this picture of uh, Kurt Riley's on the left there and, 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 and our, our, our Akama friends, we actually, um, EcoFlight, we were able to partner with and we took an you know, airplane trip and saw, saw the landscape from the air. Um, Comb Ridge from the air, I recommend it. Um, that was amazing to see. And, uh, and what, we, what we found is that, um, is that it was one of the most intellectually and emotionally satisfying things that I've ever done. Um, intellectually, and I'll get to these aspects at, at the end on my conclusion, but um, it challenged me to th rethink my views of, of archaeology, but it was also, it was also just very, very powerful to see members from Akama who have never been, some of them had never been up to this area of the world, um, say that this feels like returning home. And, um, and it was a very emotional and, and meaningful sort of experience. Our next steps is to um, currently, um, uh, the Akama community members and, and leaders are discussing where to go from here. What sort of action is appropriate to take uh, for, for future, future directions? And, uh, and we're gonna go to the, the, the non Akama members are gonna go down to, uh, to, the, to the Pueblo in April to discuss our next steps. The really interesting thing is an archeologist, a really type A individual is that I want action plans and deadlines and we don't have deadlines here. We don't, we're not, there's no pressure. This is a co-equal sort of creation. And the, the thing is, is the more humble we all are and the more relaxed we all are, things happen and they happen at a pretty quick pace um, in really good ways. And so it's been a really um, educational experience um, working with, with, a, with the tribal group in terms of what true collaboration looks like is it's not running everything on your own time frame, but having things develop organically and develop, develop well. And so it's exciting, exciting directions for this partnership 
that uh, may take many forms, may take some form, it may go nowhere, it may have um, great action, there may be a research design, there's all these aspects, but the thing is, is that we're coming to this together. But as, uh, as I'm, I'll return to some of these issues, but I wanted to um, now hand the mic over to, uh, to Kenny, who's going to talk about the archeological and historical significance of this place, which is absolutely astounding. So Kenny? Take it away. Thank you, Sam. Today I'm going to make the case that oh, we're calling. Today I'm going to make the case that the land we're calling the lands between, together with the rest of the Central Mesa Verde region, is responsible for an outsized contribution to the Pueblo cultural tradition. As we all know, the Pueblo cultural tradition is one of a handful of major American anthropological traditions including the ancestral Pueblo era here in the Northern Southwest. In the interest of time, I'm making this case today in a rather simplistic manner, sort of at the 30,000 foot level, metaphorically speaking. Next slide, please. Sam already showed, let me start by talking just a little bit more about the lands between, a few more details that Sam didn't provide. Sam showed the map at left already, and but and the map at right shows the lands between set within the southeast corner of Utah. It's kind of a blow up of the southeast corner of Utah. So the big brown polygon at left is Bears Ears National Monument at about a million and a half acres. The pink polygon to its right is the lands between or what we're calling the lands between. It's about half a million acres of public that is BLM and state trust lands, uh, again, between Bears Ears and the Colorado state line. To the south of both of those, it's shown in tan, is the um, Utah portion of the Navajo Nation. All those little blue squares that you see scattered about are state trust land sections. Um, and the figures that I just gave of a million and a half acres for Bears Ears and about a half a million acres for the lands between include those trust lands. Next slide, please. This map is just a little bit more of a blow up of the lands between, which is the green polygon at center. Bears Ears is behind the blue, dark blue line at left, and Canyons of the Ancients is shown here um, in yellow on the right. Notice the similarity between Canyons of the Ancients and the lands between. Um, Lands Between kind of looks like a Western bookend of Canyons of the Ancients. This is for a fundamentally good reason, and that reason is they're part of a singular landscape known as the Great Sage Plain. Next slide, please. The Great Sage Plain is the 19th century name given to the highlands linking Monticello, Utah, up here at top left, and Cortez, Colorado, down at lower right. It doesn't show very well on this image, but the Great Sage Plain also topographically wraps rather tightly around the base of the Abajo Mountains, west of Monticello, toward the south and west, going down toward Bluff, Utah, where Great Sage Plain meets what the geologists call the Monument Upwork at Comb Ridge. The San Juan River forms the southern boundary of the Great Sage Plain as depicted here. What I'd like you all to do if you would, is think of the Great Sage Plain geographically as a huge south-southwest facing low amphitheater. It's composed of gently sloping and downstepping mesas and canyons that all drain generally southward into the San Juan River via a number of drainages like McElmo running from east to west, McElmo, Montezuma, Recapture, and Cottonwood. Next slide, please. This slide generally shows the, shows the location of the lands between set within the Mesa Verde region shown here in tan, which is, as we know, an archeological construct. It's an archeological region. Crow Canyon researchers and others have further divided the Mesa Verde into three subdivisions, Western, Central, and Eastern, which I'll go into in a minute or so. The lands between comprises the Western heart of the Central Mesa Verde. Next slide, please. 
these three points outline the core of my argument that the lands between um, turned into an acronym in the title here, TLB, the lands between, as an inter the lands between as an integral part of the Central Mesa Verde made an outsized contribution to the history of the Pueblo cultural tradition. The first point here is that elevated an elevated human population through time was present on the Great Sage Plain and elsewhere in the Central Mesa Verde during the Ancestral Pueblo era, from Basket Maker III onward. This human density is largely due to the topographic character of the Great Sage Plain, which is the aforementioned south-southwest facing topographic amphitheater, gathered monsoonal moisture each summer. But it's also, I believe, due to the fact that the heads of three of the four major drainages in the Grand in the Great Sage Plain, Cottonwood, Recapture, and Montezuma Canyons, are all located in the Abajo Mountains and adjacent highlands to the west of the Abajos. So those three drainages thus had a better chance of being perennial streams with high internal water tables, which would have also been favorable to Pueblo agriculture. My second point shown here is that the archeological evidence for the elevated population levels through time lies in two strong archeological patterns. First, a greater quantity of sites overall. And second, the presence of more big sites, that is sites with large momentary populations than most of the rest of the Southwest. My third point showed here is that these heightened population levels drove important social developments that were fundamental to the history of the Pueblo cultural tradition. These developments are discussed by the editors and authors of two books referenced here that were published about a decade ago. Next slide, please. Now for a little archeological evidence. This slide shows three subdivisions, the three subdivisions of the Mesa Verde region that I mentioned earlier. The central Mesa Verde is shown here in blue shading. To the left of that um, is the Western subdivision and bears the green outline of Bears Ears National Monument takes in much of that. This slide also shows all recorded sites from the ancestral Pueblo era as single dots, which when clustered form hotspots. Notice how many more dots and hotspots are found in the central Mesa Verde. While most of these hotspots are in Southwest Colorado, there are also quite a few on the Utah side of the central Mesa Verde in the lands between. I recognize that dot, the dot density disparity between Southwest Colorado and Southeast Utah is shown here. I offer that this is related to differences in archeological survey coverage between the two states. But ultimately the point I'm trying to make through this slide here is that the higher frequency and density of sites shown here in the central Mesa Verde supports the assertion of higher population levels in the central Mesa Verde versus other regions. But more total sites is just part of the story of higher population levels in a region such as the central Mesa Verde. Next slide, Sam. The other important consideration when talking about population levels in a region is site size. That is, how many people were living in a given size at a given site at a given time. There are no shortage of big, well-populated sites in the lands between in the Central Mesa Verde. Sites like the one shown in this slide, Bruce Site 13 on Alkali Ridge or Alkali Point, dates to the Pueblo I period. Dozens and dozens of structures. Next slide, please. Or this site, known as 10 Acre Pueblo on Alkali Point, which dates to the Pueblo III period and was mapped and excavated, partially excavated by Kidder, Cummings, and Judd in 1908. Next slide, please. Or Coal Bed Village in Montezuma Canyon. The site plan shown here is that of the early 13th century village, but there were many previous large occupations at this site, which has been the subject of investigations by Brigham Young University and others since 2018. The point I'm making here is that there are more big sites with large momentary populations in the lands between and throughout the central Mesa Verde than there are in much of the rest of the Southwest. 
the combination of more sites of all sizes and more sites with large momentary populations evinces substantial human populations in the lands between and throughout the central Mesa Verde. Next slide, if you would. As previously mentioned, these greater populations led to important social transformations that were fundamental to the Pueblo cultural tradition. This is a huge idea that was first developed and discussed by the authors and editors of the book on the left and put into a broader context by the author of the book on the right. Next slide, please. Allow me to give one, just one quick, really quick archeological example of this taken from the lands between during the early Pueblo period. This site plan is part of a Bascomaker three village on the Southwest edge of the Great Sage Plain. Note that there's are small houses and one big house which is shown, which is shown at the left. This larger house designated here as structure two, big house, is interpreted as a community center. This, is, this site here, Malloy Village, is one of two known Bascomake three villages in the Great Sage Plain. Both are loosely aggregated villages with community centers and reasonably high momentary populations. But the point here is that in both villages, there's distance between each family's domicile, that is living structures, storage structures, and midden versus their neighbors. The intra-village pattern during Basket Maker 3 is for at least some open ground between each family's domestic space. Next slide, please. Contrast that, that previous Basket Maker 3 pattern with this site, the aforementioned Pueblo 1 site known as Brews Site 13, shown being, being shown for the second time in this presentation. Notice how all the storage structures are linked together and how tightly everything is packed together. This is an example of significant aggregation, both in the terms of closer physical proximity and in terms of site size, that is the number of people living in a site represented by all of the structures in the site. This kind of aggregation is a fundamental trend in the central Mesa Verde and likely co-occurred with social changes allowing for people to sustainably live together in such close proximity and in greater numbers. Next slide, if you would. These important social transformations were not left behind during the great migrations from the San Juan River drainage to the Little Colorado and Rio Grande River drainages in the 13th century common era. This ends my part of the presentations and I'll gladly hand the microphone to my friend and colleague, Kurt Riley. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. I introduce myself in my traditional manner, noting my name, Atlaya, which is a plant that usually be, begins blooming in early spring, since I was born in the springtime. And I'm a member of the Sun Clan of the Pueblo of Akuma, and also Little Sun from the Pueblo of Laguna. This is a picture of the Akuma Valley. And if you can go back in time, maybe my ancestors were looking at this valley, wondering if this was the place that was prepared for them or Hakuta. And so um, I just wanted to show you uh, the village. You can see it off in the distance, but next slide, please. We can take a look at the village from the west, or uh, from the east looking west. You be can begin to see the villages there at the very top of the mesa. And the most dominant building on the mesa top is the um, Spanish mission of San Esteban del Rey. Next slide. And here you can see the size of the actual church. And so, one can conclude that the Akuma people are um, skilled in building large structures that stand the test of time. Next slide. This is a picture of tribal leadership. And so it hasn't changed very much. It needs repair back then, but we try to keep up the church as best we can. Next slide. 
Going to the village, this is the most northern row of homes. Again, looking um, westward. Next slide. So this is a modern day um, picture looking east. And while I was in office, I got trapped up in the, the old village and took the opportunity to go out and take this picture looking towards the plaza. So next slide. Our oral history tells us that we migrated somewhere to the south. Our emergence from Shipap at the time took us on this long road to the south where we live today. And when I was growing up, I often wondered, where is this place? So this is looking north towards um, what, um, Kawishima, or the cold place. This is the northern mountain. And Akuma has been involved in a lot of issues, among them trying to protect Chaco Canyon proper. And so the Pueblo of Akuma and the Akuma Historic Preservation Advisory Board was tasked to relay back to um, the federal government our actual ties back to Chaco. And so we took it upon ourselves to go ahead and retrace our trail that leads to Chaco Canyon or Waspa Shaka. So next slide, please. Here you see members of the Akuma team as we begin our journey, um, not really towards the peak, but off to the right towards the Northwest of Mount Taylor. Next slide. So here we go down the other side and off into some of the, the lowland areas of the northern part of, of Mount Taylor. And so, next slide. As we look towards Chaco, we can see um, landmarks that actually show us that, yes, we are, we're close. Next slide, please. So along the way, we visited Pueblo uh, sites. Um, when we do enter these places, we pay our respects to the ancestors who lived there. And so once we're done, we start to take readings. We look back towards uh, Mount Taylor to get our bearings. And we also um, survey the area for other resources. Next slide. During the more recent times, we've invited other Pueblos. Here's a picture of one of the sites, site trips that we made. Um, with us on this particular field trip was the Pueblo of Laguna and the Pueblo of Zia. Next slide. So we also visited other places to get an idea of really of the expanse of our ancestors and where they lived. This is Kenyaha. I hope I pronounced that right. Sorry, I chopped up the Navajo name. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Kim Biniola was another one. And so next slide. As we visited these areas, we noted obviously evidence. But to us as uh, members, we noted the evolution of these pottery shards. To us, that meant these were revisited. The technology and changes in the ceramics, to us, that we revisited these places with the new technology. But at every site, next slide, Sam, we also noted not only the pottery, but the plant life. In other words, what other resources had to be available for these uh, people to live in that area? Next slide. So we note the plants, the both medicinal, herbal, and utilitarian um, resources. We noted the health of these plants and their number. And next slide, please. We also noted water sources. Um, these I, no I came across at one of the sites and I noted that the pools had actually been scraped to hold more water and noted some um, 
diversion of this water. Up in the upper screen of this slide, you can see wolfberry, which we've been told is an indication of cultivation of dry farming. Next slide. We also note clay deposits. Obviously, if you break a pot, you need to make another one. And so you have to have these resources nearby to be able to um, have another cooking pot or utilitarian where available. Next slide. But the most important of the resources that we look for are cultural resources. And for us, it is who we are as Pueblo people, as Kenny noted earlier, it was the social cultural um, evolution of who we became, who we are today, that we look for. And so it's not just, you know, the ruins, as they're called, but the uh, past villages and what it took for the people to live there that we survey as well. Next slide, Sam. And so we here we are at South Mesa near Chaco Canyon. Uh, we're not on a school outing. It looks like the uniform of the day was blue, but we just all happen to be <laughs> dressed in blue. But here we are. Uh, next slide, Kenny. And we're, what we were looking at was a possible cultural site. So you see the members here discussing their findings, walking around, uh, surveying the land as before, water sources, plant life, mineral resources. And so our work, um, is not just surrounding the sites, but the landscape basically is what we're looking at. Next slide, Sam. And so in 2015, I believe, is what my first exposure to southeastern Utah. Um, at the time, um, Josh Ewing and Kenny were there at the Friends of Cedar Mesa, and they took me out onto the landscape, and I was very fortunate to do so. The lands that I saw were looked very familiar. They were not any different than where I came from. And so it seemed very familiar. And yet, next slide, please, Sam. I could tell by the size of this cedar tree that these lands were very old. And the plant life has been there for centuries. On the Akama Reservation, cedar trees don't grow this tall and this wide. Um, and so I knew that this was a land that was very much different. Next slide, Sam. So this is a site that Kenny took me to. And if you remember the slide from Akama, the village was set above, um, high up on a mesa. The farming area was below it. There was only one access up, although at Akama and probably here, if we did do a survey from a public's perspective, we could probably locate um, an access to this site, but you can see who's coming, who's going, and all the resources that you need are readily available. Next slide, Sam. And the construction of the buildings was very similar, very familiar. Um, Next slide. But as Josh took me to what we now know as the migration panel, I was awed by it. Josh allowed me to be by myself there, alone. And even now, I, I feel so much emotion looking at this panel. And it's the cultural resources that really made that trip uh, memorable. So next slide, please. So when you, I looked at this migration panel, I saw things that were very familiar. Um, and I knew even then that I had to bring more people from Alkama to this place to see what they saw in these images. Next slide, Sam. 
As for mission, um, we passed Josh and I on our way to a different site. And I noted it, but we were running out of time and light at the time. But I took a quick snapshot of it. And this, these are the kinds of things that, that we board members note and, and investigate. So next slide, Sam. So I blew this slide up and I noted this formation. I believe there's one more slide, uh, Sam. And the closer I looked, it became very interesting. Much like those pools that were scraped into the sandstone, is this a natural formation or is it man-made? And if man-made to divert water resources, what's downstream? And so this is the kind of work that only Pueblo people, I think, in my opinion, observe. And so next I, um, as we noted before, um, a group of 15 individuals from the Pueblo of Acoma went out to southeastern Utah. And in this slide, as Kenny was referring to the Great Sage Plain, we went there. And through LIDAR technology, we know that if you look at the LIDAR, there's still rows of farming areas. And this covers acres of land that was former farmland. And so I could understand after listening to Kenny's presentation, this was sustaining a very large population of public people. And so next slide, Sam. So as we went to the migration panel, we were already becoming emotional, I think, um, just on the trip. And the non akama members of the group allowed us to go up by ourselves. And we had prepared as if though we were going on a pilgrimage. Next slide, Sam. And so we take our offerings. And when we look back, we realize that we were again on a trail that had been blazed by our ancestors. Next slide, Sam. And so this is a picture of one of the elders, Mr. Lloyd Tortolita. And he had a big smile on his face. And he said, we've come home. And I think uh, as Sam related, most of the group felt like this was home. Many of the group members had never been to Southeastern Utah, much like myself, the very first time. But we all felt this sense that this is home. Next slide. But where is Ship Up was the next question. Is it further north? This is Bears Ears. Is it in Bears Ears somewhere? Or well, where exactly in reference to the migratory panel are we? Next slide, Kenny. Or Sam. And so in looking at the work that we've done to protect Jocko, it's hard to be so far away and yet be involved in this protection. And as I reflected back on that visit, I remember Kurt Anschutz, our archeologist saying, your people's migration was an epic migration. Your people's commitment over time was always with the intent of allowing future people to reach Ago. And so when I reflected back on that migration, the commitment of individuals to, to the trip, not really knowing whether or not they would ever see that place that was prepared for us, but were committed to that portion of the trip for future generations. Next slide. I began to think that we have to bring our young people into the picture. We have to show them places like Chaco Canyon. We have to teach them about their inheritance and how important it is. 
for them to become involved. Like, Sam. Because now it's going to be their turn to pick up where we leave off sometime into the future. Next slide, Sam. So again, going back to Akamai and looking back towards the north, you know, you kind of figure, well, what, how, and how can we get involved in the protection, not only of Chapel Canyon, but now southeastern Utah. And so in talking to other members of the Akama um, HPO, next slide, Sam, came up with this idea. We have had some good experiences in the past. This is a picture of members of the US Forest Service. They asked the Pueblo of Akama Historic Preservation Advisory Board members to come on a consultation trip. We actually hiked the trail that they were proposing to put into the forest. And once we got to this area, the Forest Service staff allowed us to um, go off on our own and do a cultural survey. And here we are giving them feedback, advising them that this trail should be moved. It should be moved in an into an area where it doesn't impact on cultural resources that were recognized by the, by the members. And so they are. And so trust and collaboration and partnership with the Forest Service allowed us to um, protect our cultural resources. Um, and we were very thankful to the Forest Service. So next slide, Sam. So involvement of Akama and the Pueblos of New Mexico in the lands between to the north is something that we strongly advise those that are there. And it's our culture and inheritance that we're trying to protect, our cultural resources. As I've said before, um, We've been told that Akama religious leadership used to go back into these areas. And we truly believe that. Once Bears Ears was known to us and the migratory panel, during my administration, our cultural leadership did go back to Southeast in pilgrimage, in respect, to go back to those cultural resources and bring them home. And so next I can eat. Now that we know that southeastern Utah was inhabited by our ancestors and have left their mark, we have to acknowledge that as Pueblo people and return. Return to those cultural resources and bring them home for our sustenance and our future for our children. Next slide, Sam. So this is a personal opinion. There's now physical and scientific evidence that Akamad's oral history is true. Our epic migration from this area can be traced from where we live back into Southeastern Utah. This inheritance has never been forgotten and has been visited in the past. There are cultural resources that continue to be present in that area and that only knowledgeable descendant members can identify. Cultural resources continue to be used today. Access to them, however, requires collaboration and partnership and trust with others. Future federal action must involve descendant Pueblos in the management and administration of this. Next slide, Sam. So in conclusion, these are my personal opinion again. Native American and Alaska Native descendant communities have a unique oral migration. Involving descendant communities in the administration and management of their ancestral homelands allows for partnership opportunities with state, federal, county, and private institutions to provide a more accurate interpretation of their ancestral history. For most descendant communities, all archaeological sites are sacred but not all sacred sites are archeological. The landscape is what sustained these ancient communities. 
And today, those same resources continue to sustain their descendant community wherever they are located. So that ends my portion of the presentation. It went a little long, but uh, I'll turn it over to Sam real quick. Thank you. Dawa. Thanks, Kurt. Well, we can just wrap up. I appreciate both your words and uh, and Kenny's. Uh, this is is truly no one can speak for everyone, but we all are on the same page, and that's uh, I guess that's where partnership starts. Um, this has been, like I mentioned, for the archaeologists on the on the crew, um, quite a journey so far. I think anyone who's doing any kind of archaeology or heritage in the Southwest is realizing that we are fundamentally rethinking how we do archaeology and how we do southwestern archaeology and it's one thing to intellectually think we need to work and involve native communities and but it's another thing trying to figure out how to do it and how to do it right how to do it effectively and uh, collaboration is super obvious but how to do it isn't and it's going to be super contextual um you know we're archaeologists and akama Members are working together in 2023. Will it be different next year? Maybe, um, but it's always going to change. And um, it's there's no one size fits all sort of thing. But there are some takeaways. The first is that listening has been really important. Me, I have a hard time shutting up. Being quiet and listening to people around me, not just my Akima colleagues, but my archaeological ones, has been totally groundbreaking in my education process. And, um, and, and also being there. Um, Zoom is great, conference calls are great, but being in these landscapes and experiencing these places, we have different experiences, but you know, those of you non-Native folks who do archeology span or just like to hike out there, there is an importance and significance and meaning to these places. They might not be the same to a Pueblo person, but we all share that these are important places. Also, uncertainty is okay. Like I mentioned, I have no idea where this project is going. Kurt, do you have any idea where this project is going? Who knows? But things are going well. And the more we just sit back and not push things, people are more comfortable with talking to each other, gaining trust and, and being creative and saying, hey, why don't we try this? Has anyone tried that? No, let's do it. You know, And that's, that's sort of where this kind of collaborations go. And this is not just us. This is so many groups in the Southwest and the Americas are doing this kind of work. But the most important thing that I think we found is that in the last two years, relationship building is the most important thing. The fact that I can count Kurt and my other academic colleagues as friends now um, is, is huge. And, and, and we trust each other and we talk to each other and challenge each other. And, and those are really important aspects. And I think before we do anything big, and we are gonna do big things, we need to build this foundation. And I think that's been really, really important. And it takes time, but man, I think it pays off. And to finish, I just want to, Akama um, on their um, uh, cultural preservation board has a saying that it's it. And I, I really like this, uh, the three R's, the Pueblos of Akama's um, um, ethic in, um, in, in uh, uh, responsibility. I had to change my, my, uh, my viewpoint here so I can read it. I'll read it. Um, let us respect what the ancestors left for us and generations still unborn through their through, and generations still unborn through their love and sacrifice. Let us show the responsibility of protecting our traditional cultural properties, sacred sites, and other important cultural resources. And everything we do is a reflection back on us, participants in the protection of cultural resources important to our history, culture, and identity, and as human beings. And I think that this is a wonderful. Um, philosophy to guide our work and maybe collaboration going forward. And just to finish up, I want to say thank you. I know we went a little long. I think we all did. We're so excited. We could have talked about for all day to you about this project. You're welcome to contact us and talk to us about this project. And especially talking to Crow Canyon folks, this is your area of the world. We'd love to hear more from you as well. Um, and I just want to thank the people who have funded this project. Um, uh, Bears Ears Partnership, National Parks Conservation Association, the Pueblo of Akama, and the University of Oklahoma through the Humanities Forum and the Vice President for Research and Partnerships. So thank you very much. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, all three of you, for such an amazing presentation. And, and that was 
that wasn't too long at all. Don't, don't worry at all, Sam. Um, I know we had a lot of viewers that were really interested and um, and and wow, just to hear from all three of you was, was really, really great. Uh, so yeah, we do have a few questions. Um, I tried to consolidate a few that were, were similar. Um, but uh, yeah, so maybe why don't you, let's see here, Sam, maybe if you could go back to a, like a, a pretty landscape scene, at least to, so I can introduce a couple of these questions. There you, yeah, anything's good. Better than the black screen. There you go. My favorite landscape. Um, great. Well, so um, there was one question right at the beginning, and I, I think um, with your initial group that you went out on the landscape with, one one of the viewers noticed that there weren't any women involved um, in that particular group. But I was wondering if you could talk, are there women involved in this partnership as well, public women or archaeologists or, or, or otherwise? Kurt, you want to field that? Talk about uh, your uh, the preservation board and their representation on there. On that first trip, uh, that was just uh, a few of the members that were able to go. On the second trip, we invited two women, and those two women sit on our Akama Historic Preservation Advisory Board. We want to encourage women to participate as they have their different roles in public society they look at difference very uh look at things very much different on the second trip there were two women that went along well that's great that's great um <clears throat> yeah no that's uh we've heard that on other other presentations here too is how you know males and females different aspects and different age groups bring different pieces to this puzzle um, that are all of course equally as important so that's that's really great to hear um so um we have a question uh in related to kind of archaeological jargon or you know our, our kind of ways of saying things uh one person wanted to clarify what do you mean kenny by momentary population can you tell us a little bit more about what that means and how you maybe figure that out at least generally yeah sure Thanks, Ben, and thanks to the person who posed that question. Um, momentary population, as I use it, is just the number of people living in a given site at a given time. And ultimately, we don't know what that is. It's kind of a, a hard thing to get at sometimes, and we have to make some assumptions. But basically, it's our best guess of how many people lived in a given site at a given time. And when you've got a big site, like some of the sites I showed plans of, and they all seem to have the same kind of material culture in them, we have to assume they were all, all of those houses were being lived in at the same time. And so we make an estimate of, of the population. So momentary population is just ultimately the, the our best guess of the number of people in a given site at a given time. Great. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Um, let's see here. So um, uh, one viewer asked, uh, as a, a frequent visitor to southeastern Utah, hiking around to see the landscape and archaeological sites, but as a non-native, this person is wondering, is, you know, how can a non-Akama or non-native visitor engage more respectfully and meaningfully with uh, a site? Um, or is it best for folks not to visit? What would you all recommend? I think I can answer that, um, Ben. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. I think that um, now the Bears Ears Coalition, if you visit the visitor center, provides um, information about visiting the area respectfully. And I think that, you know, it's important for non-native people, no matter where they travel, to seek that guidance uh, wherever they go. And I'm just one person from the community. Um, and what I would advise is go to the Bears Ears Coalition website and obtain that information. Um, in a general sense, don't wander. <laughs> don't wander around. Uh, going exploring, um, but stay to the established sites 
and leave uh, as you came. You know, take your trash out and don't take anything, leave it there uh, as we did. I mean, we took photos, but you know, we left everything there. Um, those are the things that I think, you know, at any site is, is to be respectful, stay on the trails. Although most of it is on BLM land. So, you know, you can't really, <laughs> they stay on the trail, but those are just some guidances. Great. Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, visit with respect messaging, of course, is is very important. And I know here at Crow Canyon, we we talk with folks a lot about that is how to um, how to visit these places respectfully. And a good rule of thumb I use that I've I learned like maybe nowhere how long ago is you know take only photographs, leave only footprints. Uh, but then, of course, in today's day and age. Don't post your pictures online with any geotagging. <laughs> you gotta add that caveat. Um, but great. Well, yeah. So thank you for for answering that too. Um, let's see here. So another question came up. Um, gosh, related again to kind of a specific archaeological um, set of artifacts known collectively as. Chamahias, and I've heard that's an Akama um, or a, a Keras word, um, and they're these little stone axe-like things. Uh, do you have any insights on on those? Is that something you guys are familiar with? I I know that there are are some stone tools, and and I don't recognize the pronunciation, but um, we acknowledge that, you know, a lot of the things, and that's a disappointment, um, a lot of the artifacts that were um, taken from these sites um, really gives a person a well-rounded um, view of what it took to live there. You know, uh, I've seen artifacts that were taken out of Chaco, the farming spades that were made from stone, the axes. Um, but sometimes what are revealed really shouldn't be noted to the public. Um, I believe in, it, when I, in 2015, the governor at the time, Fred Vaya Sr. and I went to the Maxwell Museum because they were, they have the artifacts that were taken from Chapo. They were um, going to uh, have a new display at Chapo and they wanted us to look at the artifacts and point out items that uh, were okay to be viewed publicly and others that were, shouldn't be there. And so we noted those things, um, but I'm not familiar with the exact um, item that the person was talking about. Well, great. Well, um, we'll have to give you or give. We'll have to investigate that and see if we can discuss it another, another time. Um, so, another question related to visiting um, landscapes um, is: you know, how can visitors more actively contribute to preservation of these places? Um, are there, um, say, groups people should join or events they should go to or people they should talk to, things they should do when they're either on the landscape or at home planning that can help to enhance um, uh, the preservation and conservation of these significant and sacred places? So I'll handle that one if I may, Ben. <clears throat> we have, um, we have a person that that this the the person who asked the question should really talk with, and we have programs that integrate volunteers into this kind of thing. Um, it's we call it our ambassador program, and it's it's a wing of our overall visit with respect um, program. And um, ambassadors get involved in in helping remind people out on the trailhead that you know you're on sacred space. Uh, and, and they do a lot of good. And just generally, if this person wants to get a hold of me, I will point he or her to our Visit with Respect coordinator, and we'd love to have, have you be involved with us. 
Great, thanks. Um, yeah, and then so um, yeah, and that's such an important thing to do is you know get people involved, and that's something we see a lot here is in this at Crow Canyon and in, in, in the Southwest as archaeologists is that people, most people really do want to be involved and they really do want to help and do the right thing, but they just don't always know the proper way to do that or who to talk to. So thank you very much for your answer, Kenny. Um, and then, so really the final question that, that we've had uh, posed so far is just a reference back to some of the books you talked about, Kenny. Um, yeah. Can you maybe tell us that, or pop back to that slide too and show us the titles of those so these people can look and look them up? Can we go back to that slide, Sam? Is that a possibility? If we can, I can just give the, I can recite the names. There we are. So the first book on the left was published in 2012. Um, it's a little hard to get a hold of, but it's still out there on Amazon, et cetera. It's a really great book. It's an edited volume. Uh, again, as you can see, the title is Crucible of Pueblos, the Early Pueblo Period in Northern Southwest. The book on the right is probably a little bit easier to get a hold of. Um, and uh, it's uh, A Pueblo Social History by John A. Ware. And uh, it's a little more broad in its contextual um, and it, well, if, on one hand, it's more broad, broad, and on another hand, it's it's more focused. But those are the, the two books. And uh, if you search those titles on Amazon, um, then you can find them. And I noticed Taylor just put up a, a link to the UCLA Press for the former book. Thank you, Taylor. Good books. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Great. Um, well, uh, that concludes all of the questions that we have um, uh, for this evening. So I want to just say thank you again very much, all three of you, uh, Kurt Riley, Sam Dooley, and Kenny Wentz for joining us and for your really just astounding and, and top-notch presentation for this, this evening's webinar. Um, and we, we hope to hear from from all of you uh, again in the future, and we'd love to hear more about the the, uh, the progress and the future of this project. So please come back and, and speak with us again, and and thank all of you who joined us out there in Internet Land uh, for this great webinar. And we look forward to uh, hearing from you and seeing you next week. So thank you very much. <laughs>